Mm -hmm. only for Canada. And uh, before we get to all that, though, let's get you caught up on all the headlines. This business update is brought to you by Walk a Mile in Her Shoes, Toronto's walk to end violence against women. October 1st, visit walkamiletoronto.org for more. Here are the top business stories we're following this hour at BNN. Wei Zhen Tang stands accused of running what could be the biggest Ponzi scheme ever in Canada. In June, the Ontario Securities Commission laid 12 charges of fraud and other alleged stock and trading violations that could result in maximum penalties of 60 years in jail and a $60 million fine. In an exclusive interview with BNN, Wei Zhen Tang told us he knows what investors need to succeed, and he also adamantly denied he was running a massive Ponzi scheme. Ponzi people do not know the market. I know the market so well. You ask anybody in the market who know better than me. You know, who know where the market is going? Who call the market? You see my website. I know so much, you know, timing and so much things about the market and so much timing of the market. Nobody else comparable to me. Strength in the auto sector helped push Canada's wholesale sales well past expectations in July. StatsCan says wholesale sales climbed 2.8% to almost $42 billion. It was the second straight monthly increase. Five of the seven trade sectors posted gains. The Commissioner of America's Federal Housing Administration says the agency has enough money to cover future losses. He says that means the FHA will not require taxpayer assistance or new congressional action. In order to maintain government-mandated reserves, the FHA says it will appoint a risk officer as well as make changes to its credit policies. The agency has guaranteed about a quarter of all U.S. home loans made so far this year. The Wall Street Journal is reporting the U.S. Federal Reserve will soon have a hand in setting pay levels for thousands of bank employees across America. The move would mark the first time government regulators would participate in compensation decisions, which are normally the domain of the bank's boards and executives. The plan would allow the Fed to reject any pay practices it felt encouraged excessive risk-taking. There are lots of laughs at the Wharton School of Business when former Merrill Lynch CEO John Thane said he should have shopped at IKEA. In a speech at the University of Pennsylvania School, Thane said that he decorated his office in the Merrill style, which was very, very nice. He said he's sorry he did that, and if he had to do it all over again, he'd furnish the office in IKEA. The remark was met with laughter and applause. Thane was accused of overspending on a renovation just as the brokerage firm was on the brink of collapse. And that is your business update from Business News Network. On the other side of the break, your full market update. Stay with us. I'm not a captain, but I can show you a better way to fly. It's called avioning. Look at all these seats. Hmm. Oh, but I'm sorry, sir. Your card only allows access to a few. But with the RBC Avion card, your points are used to buy seats on any flight. So the world is your oyster. Shuck away, my friend. Shuck away. Find reward seats on any airline. Avioning, the easiest way to fly. The all-new 2010 Mercedes-Benz E-Class may say that you've arrived. But that doesn't mean you can't enjoy getting there. Copper Mountain's mining project is an open pit pore-free copper mine just outside Princeton, British Columbia. On July 30th, Copper Mountain and Mitsubishi Materials Corp. signed an agreement. They did advance us $28.75 million. And with those funds, uh, we did start construction earlier this spring. We finished the feasibility study in uh, 2007. More recently, we were able to add the 2008 drilling results, and they increased our resources up to about 5 billion pounds of copper. And our initial focus has to be to uh, get the mine in production, producing normally 105 million pounds of copper per year by the first half of 2011. We've had some uh, very exciting results from geophysical studies, and uh, these have given us targets that uh, warrant uh, a lot more exploration drilling.
This market update is brought to you by Hampton by Hilton. At Hampton by Hilton, we love having you here. Markets turned into the red in Canada. You'll be able to see it on this intraday TSX chart. I'm showing we're down about 45 points or so. Uh, we tried to climb into the green at the open, but uh, we're sliding down a little bit. Uh, materials leading the way to the downside. Healthcare to the upside. Here are some of the, um, the uh, laggards first. Let's look at the weak stocks. Uh, mostly golds and oil. Uh, you can see CP Rail also down on the Stiefel Nicholas sell rating that came out this morning. On the leadership side, we have the financials, some of the financials, including Manulife, following that uh, presentation they did at the Scotia Summit yesterday. RIM must have been overflow from the U2 concert here in Toronto yesterday. There were a lot of Blackberries there. SXC Healthcare, despite the fact that they Price that issue at 4150. That's a US number. This thing is on wheels. They couldn't get enough of it. They had to bump the offering. In the United States, let's look at those markets uh, which are still in the green. Uh, right, well, actually, the NASDAQ and the SP just now slipping into uh, negative territory. The Dow still higher, largely because of two upgrades. One was Chevron, the other was Procter and Gamble. Citigroup going to buy on this name. They have a $66 target. They are commenting on the fact that they think P&G is just going to be that much more aggressive in getting share. And some of these uh, consumer staple stocks have lagged the market. You may see some more upgrades. Uh, but P&G is the one this morning. And that is your Market Minute on the Business News Network. And the federal finance minister right now is set to announce potentially a consultation period that may lead to the elimination of all remaining import tariffs on machinery and equipment. At least that's according to a report in the Globe and Mail today. Now McGee has been taking a look at this story now. Yeah, we do not have confirmation yet from the finance minister. I called uh, the finance minister's office. They say they've seen the report, but right now they have nothing yet uh, to announce. But uh, here's what the Globe and Mail is reporting. The Globe and Mail is reporting that the finance minister will announce a consultation period that will last about seven weeks that will look at the possibility of eliminating all remaining tariffs on machinery and equipment. And um, this, of course, would have a potentially a positive impact on companies, for example, that deal in the auto parts sector, printers, sawmills, any industrials that really have to import parts as part of their building uh, of machinery. And according to the Globe, in the uh, announcement that the minister is, uh, will make, uh, that uh, the minister is saying it will give a short-term boost to the manufacturing sector and also give Canada a long-term competitive edge. How expensive are these imports for Canadian manufacturing? Um, I spoke to someone at Export Development Canada. It does not seem to be a huge issue right now, primarily because of NAFTA. Uh, Canadian manufacturers don't really, uh, aren't really subject to any massive imports currently from Mexico or the U.S. because of NAFTA. The export development person told me that's more, it's more to do with over the pond uh, imports. So if, if Canadians are importing stuff from Europe or Japan, then potentially, for sure, there'll be some savings. I should also note that the minister has already made some uh, progress on this front. In January, uh, the minister eliminated about uh, $440 million worth of import tariffs that were remaining at that point and uh, 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 reportedly the value of the remaining import tariffs that may be eliminated is only about 300 million so it doesn't seem mm. like it like it'll be a huge deal in terms of dollars saved for Canadian manufacturers but a little bit is a little bit I guess interesting coincidence that the G20 just happens to be coming up next week it is coming up next week and uh, we should remember as well that the US caught in a little bit of a trade spot with China over um, uh, imposing <laughs> 35% um, tariffs on uh, the import of Chinese tires. So uh, potentially, I guess we can ask some of our guests about this. Does this put Canada in a more favorable, favorable light vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and next, uh, next week's uh, G20 summit? Uh, the WTO had also recently complained about policy slippage amongst the G20. In other words, people, uh, you know, getting a little looser on, uh, on uh, trade are becoming more protectionist, uh, I guess, essentially. So does this put Canada in a more favorable light vis-a-vis mm. -vis the U.S.? We'll ask some of our guests out there today. All right, thanks now. Thanks, guys. We're going to stick with trade again just for a little bit while, uh, a little bit longer now. Right now, there is a new index 
just been created to measure how much it costs to transport items across Canada by road. It's called the Canadian General Freight Index and it was launched this month. For more, we are joined by the company behind the CGFI. It's Doug Payne. He's the newly appointed president at New Logic. Doug, great to have you in. Thank you. Now, explain this index. First of all, where is the data coming from? How do you calculate it? Well, the data is coming from our database of, of information where we have over 2 million transactions a year, and we, which provides about a billion dollars of freight spend. We've taken that data, working with Dr. Alan Shape, uh, to statistically validate the accuracy of the information to be able to produce this to the marketplace. And uh, uh, before we go into what it includes or doesn't include, do we have a historical data on this or this is a go forward? We've gone this? back to January of 2008 and there's been some really interesting uh, trends that, that we've seen. Oh, okay. Well, let's talk about what's in it and what isn't in it because I understand it doesn't include liquid bulk, dry bulk, forest products, and maybe some specialized freight. Why not those things? Well, the marketplace the predominance of the marketplace is dry goods uh, moving across the country. So that's really what we focused in on to be able to have enough statistical information to make this valid. Okay, let's talk about the trends then. What are you picking up? So we don't have liquid bulk. Liquid bulk, right. uh, presumably chemicals, uh, perhaps even oil and gas. Uh, no dry bulk. Forest products aren't included. Stripping all those out, what are, what's emerging? Um, interestingly, in going from the first seven months of 2008, we saw transportation costs rise by 14%, over 14%. When you drill down underneath that, 7% of that was created by the base freight rates itself, but 44% of that increase was driven by fuel surcharge. In August of 2008, you started to see the decline in the slowing of the Canadian economy, and that drove the rates to stabilize, but fuel surcharge to, to, to come down. Interestingly, if you take from July of 2008 up to May of 2009, the rates have actually dropped by over 13% which is a pretty big number. And how much of that is fuel then, or surcharge? Predominantly, that, that is driven by fuel, but if you drill down a little bit deeper and you look at from the domestic freight, the domestic freight rates have dropped about 4 to 5%, and if you look at the cross-border rates, they've actually driven dropped somewhere between 6 and 9%. Part of that is from the weakening Canadian dollar, and the other part of that is through freight increases predominantly in the truckload sector. Now, how sensitive is this index to swings in the Canadian dollar versus the U.S. dollar? Well, I, I think it, it definitely has a play, in particular in the cross-border business. Um, and the other Im impact that it has is the manufacturing and the, and the volume of freight that is moving back and forth and balancing of equipment in the, in the asset side of the game. So when you look at this index, there's two things that can drop out of it for, one, those people doing the shipping or companies doing the shipping. So am I right in that in the last nine months or so there, their revenues are declining by that that level absolutely is that true yes, that's and then the other side is the cost for me as a shipper right so that's a good thing yeah and, and you know I mean the idea of